Family, this week uh, we speak about the love of God. Uh, and I want you to understand, there is a, a phrase out in the world that is being used today, and it simply says that love is love. Now, in fairness, it has a socio-moral context that means you can love anyone you want, regardless of, of gender, age, uh, life, life differences. But I want you to understand, it's also being used by mankind and society and culture in a much broader way. So we'll, we've heard it within our world, love is love. But I want to test you to see if you really believe that love is love. If you, on Christmas morning, bought a present that you knew in your heart of hearts would cause your child in the future to struggle with time management, study habits, and procrastination, would buying that present be the most loving thing for your child? Would emotions overwhelm your love? And you would use the fact, well, I love my child. Let me ask you as a married couple, have you ever bought a present for your spouse knowing that you secretly wanted that gift? more than they did? I'm assuming by the laughter, the answer is yes. Did your selfishness guide your love? You see, if it's true that love is love, then love is dependent on your desires as the key determiner. What you want is the definition of love. What you think is right is the definition of love. And can you imagine the trouble we get into when we think that way? Love is one of the least understood issues in all of the pagan world. The unbelieving world knows not, nothing about love. Now here's my biggest concern. My concern is this, that the church now accepts the world's definitions and love is no longer defined by the teachings of Scripture and the examples we're hearing. So, as we're preparing for this Christmas season, and we, we use this phrase, unwrapping the wonder, we come today to what would be the third week of the Advent season. This would be the purple candle. It's, it's different than all of the others. It has a sense of intensity, of royalty that makes it distinct. And I want you to understand that the love of God really demands that purple position because only it un unveils and unwraps all of the others. So we're looking to celebrate the arrival of Jesus Christ the God of gods, born in a manure barn in Bethlehem. Please understand, don't clean up the manger. Understand the fall by which your Savior came. And what I want you to do is to ask yourself, do you think like a believer? and recognize who you are as a redeemed person? Or you, do you think nostalgically, traditionally, and celebratory as a pagan would at this holiday season? You see, in week one, we studied hope. And hope has a completely different idea from you, or to you, than anybody else in the world. Hope is a confidence that God who sent Jesus Christ to the cross and who rose again ensures to fulfill every promise that He makes. 
Last week, we looked at peace. Peace is not circumstantially based. Peace is a settled confidence in bad circumstances. Peace is a sense of fearlessness in tribulations. It's security when there's no health insurance. It's a confidence in the eternal agenda when society's breaking down. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You rest peacefully in Jesus who never leaves or forsakes. So today we're going to dive into the love of God who provides the very means of love and perfectly offers it to humanity. Family, this is profound. And even though we're, we're speaking, we're, we're addressing and worshiping 2,000 years later, you need to understand the very word love springs up uniquely in Christianity. And let me tell you why I say that. They had the word agape, and they recognized it as love. But I want, to, I want you to hear me out. None of the gods of the Greek world, none of the gods of the Roman world, none of the gods of the Egyptian world, none of the gods of the Norse world ever had an understanding of agape love. It's just not in the definition as we would give that definition. They have lust. They had desire. They had some sense of sid pro quo. You do this, I'll do this. I'll do this, I expect this. But I want you to understand, even within the Bible, as the Gospels began to use the word agape, by the time it reached Paul, it had had an evolutionary development that's so unique that now agape is said to be created by the Christian community as they acted out and lived out John 13, that's part of our day's reading. It stands unique. So let's come back and say, let's define love here this morning. Love is the plan of God to enter the story of individual sinners by giving His Son to be their Savior, tying Himself to help followers to know and enjoy Him. And I want to suggest to you, maybe the best verses that we could come back to are found in Romans chapter 5, 1 through 8. And in fairness, all four of our, our words of the Advent season are found here, and each one of them is found or find their basis in the love of God. Join me, if you would, in your own Bibles in Romans 5. If not, Join me by screen this morning so that you can have context as we look at God's Word together. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in, in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time God died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God chose His love to us, or for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so family, I, I, I want you to see here that, that all of the, the characteristics that we study in the Advent season are found here. You can see you can see hope, you can see peace, you can see joy in the word rejoicing, and all of it's given to us because the Holy Spirit has poured that love 
into us. And so I want you to understand that the first awareness that we have to have or understand of the love of God is first implanted to us in our justification. With it, we are declared righteous. Now, I hope that many of you agree with me, but the immensity of that truth grows more significant with age. And the reason I say that is this. I have been declared righteous. And yet, the older I go, the reality is there is nothing in me that's righteous. I still come back to the same anger I had when I was young. I still come back to the same sin struggles that I had when I was young. I still come back to the same materialism I had when I was young. And when I sit back and I realize there is nothing in me that I can call righteous. I haven't cleaned up, fixed up, or bettered myself in the last 40 years of ministry than I did the moment and the day I accepted Jesus Christ. And I have nothing to stand before God and say, I am righteous, save the work of Jesus Christ that declared me righteous. And family, I don't know about you, but what it made me realize, what I came to realize is, on the day I accepted Jesus Christ, I was not righteous. In the moment that I live now, I am not righteous. When I look to the confidence that I'll have in the tomorrows, I am not righteous by myself. My righteousness is only in the work of Jesus Christ that was given to me. And I was declared righteous, justified. Not because I cleaned up, fixed up, and bettered myself, but because I was transformed by submitting to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Family, that becomes the very foundation of love. Instead of fearing every failing, I am at peace with God who initiated my redemption with a plan that put Christ on the cross to take the wrath I deserved. Family, understand, as I said, I didn't clean up. I didn't deserve it when I accept it. I don't deserve it anymore now, and I will not deserve it in the tomorrows. It was a gift that I accepted. so that I might have the right love as a righteous man, understand the work that the Father planned, the effort that the Son implemented, is now poured into me by the Holy Spirit. I have agape love because I was given it by the Holy Spirit. So this morning, I want you to understand, when we look at the work of the Holy Spirit, it says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the outpouring. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 said, I don't have a spirit of fear. The spirit there is not small s spirit that some of our Bibles say. It is capital S spirit, Holy Spirit. I don't have the Holy Spirit of fear. I have the Holy Spirit of love, of power, and of self-control. This is given to me. I wouldn't know what agape love is unless it was given to me through a work of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is now involved in giving me the very source of love and I only get it from God. So family, understand, we often get excited about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We want to see some act of power, some miracle. But I want you to understand, none of those gifts are essential. 
love is. Without the love of God, we have no hope. But in the work of God, by the love of God, I confidently hope in the glory of God. I have joy here. Family, here, when you look at this text, the word rejoicing, which is used twice, is an incredible word of privilege. Now, one of the first words that you'll ever learn in the Greek language when you begin to attend uh, class to study the language is the word joy, which is the word kara. Now, any young man really can remember the word joy by remembering kara. Because any 16-year-old wants to have a kara for him to drive around in. Except men and women of Jackson County, they want to have a trucka. <laughs> but there was no word that corresponded in the Greek language to that. So we remember kara. But joy here is a completely different word. It's the word based on boast. And it can be used in a good-bad content. If you boast about yourself in arrogance and self-confidence, self-accomplishment, it's a bad word. Here it's looking down and going, do you know what God gave me? He gave me salvation. He declared me righteous. I'm awesome. I'm awesome. Because you were given a gift that changes everything. And that joy is presented and that confidence is expressed in such a way that you got nothing but excitement. And so we are given both of those by an act of God on high. And I rejoice. I am so stunned by the gift that I brag. Family, I, I, there's not too many things in world that we can express and compare this to, but let me take you back to my seventh grade year. Shotgun class, hunting safety was a couple of weeks away. All right? Mom and dad said, could I go up into their bedroom and see if some task I was supposed to run up and do? You need to understand, I'm a looker at Christmas. All right? I want to cut the surprise short as much as possible. I shake it. I cheat. I unwrap carefully and tape it back up. So I checked under their bed. Underneath there, two inches thick, 34 inches long. I knew what was there. Well, I wanted to make certain it was, so I picked it up and looked. Dropped it back down. Over the next few days, that same box is now wrapped. That same two inches thick, 34 inches long. You see, I hoped for a 20-gauge shotgun. My hope was in the confidence because I knew what I was getting. You see, my joy, my arrogance, my boasting, was already established. I knew what was in that rap gift. It was a shotgun. And everything has already been validated. And so I could be at peace on December 22nd. Because I knew what was happening on the 25th. You see, to a large degree, that's your salvation. You've been given all of these things through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, just like letting us go underneath the bed and open the box, He says, I came back from the dead. I'm the first fruit. Everything that I experience, you're going to experience. Hey, every promise and awareness, I'm in heaven. I'm at the right hand of the Father. You're going to be in glory too. This might be December 23rd for us, but the 25th is coming. And you've already seen the reality of your wrapped gift. And that wrapped gift is from the source of God on high. Family, what a privilege it is to recognize who we are 
because of who He is. Let me come back to the second. I want you to see the desire of God is loving His created. The moment God created, He identified with us for success. God has tied Himself forever with us. Family, I want you to to listen how God connects Himself in our lives with His love. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, describes it this way. He says, God was happy without man before man was created. He would have continued happy had He simply destroyed man after man had sinned. But as it is, He has set His love upon particular sinners. That's you. And the means that by His own free, voluntary choice, He will not know perfect and unmixed happiness again until He has brought every one of them, that's us, to heaven. He has in fact resolved that henceforth for all eternity His happiness shall be conditional upon ours. Family, when you and I think that we exist to bring God glory, what we often forget is that the greatest act of proclaiming Him glorious that He deserves also is the greatest privilege of glory reception that we can know. In other words, what we give to God, we get the most out of. And it is a connection and a partnership that will exist for all eternity. See, the choice of evil that that God allowed for mankind to choose to disobey Him was costly to God. Christ could have avoided the incarnation, that which we celebrate here at Christmas time. He could have avoided preserving the world through the Holy Spirit. He could have re- he could have avoided the redemption of mankind. When we give our kids in marriage, we might have the one moment of time to understand love like God's. Forgive me, those of you who have, those of you who have had daughters, how, how mixed emotions did you have as they walked down the aisle? That knucklehead doesn't deserve my girl. How many of you? How many of you look down and you recognize that the paradigm is now going to change because your son just accepted the hand of the girl that he's about to marry. That little girl that you raised is about to accept the hand of the man that's standing in front of you. And you know your paradigm's about to change. Dinner table? (laughs) Ain't gonna gonna be the same joy that you had. That, that, that evening together, that family night, it's not the same anymore. There, there's emptiness over here. There's emptiness. When, when your son or your daughter leaves into adulthood and you plan that effort and you send them off, isn't that a mixed emotional world? And you're left with something we all describe as the empty nest. All right? It's a little empty. It, it, it's a little less significant. And unless you have a strong connection with your mate, it it takes some adjustment. But if you didn't do it, the full experience of humanity would not be offered to your children. They'd be stuck in immaturity. They'd be stuck not moving out and becoming all that God had designed them to be. They wouldn't be fully human. 
And so family, you understand what it means. And you have a little understanding of the work that God has as He identifies with us. There are times when we look at bad things and we ask the question, why would God allow this evil into the world? Maybe a better question is to ask, how could God have shown a greater love to us if He removed that evil? I want you to notice, thirdly, the effort God makes to reveal His love. I need you to take your Bibles. And if you're there at, at Romans chapter 5, I want you to just come on down to that verse that we close, verse 8. And I want you to just simply recognize two words. God shows. God shows. It's in the present tense. You see, God gave His Son in history, but His work is ever-present to impress upon you who have salvation and those who need salvation that God is here among us and the work of salvation is an ever-present reality. God still interacts with us. You see, if we, still, if we believed in a historical event, forgive me, but that's completely insufficient. That does not make you a Christian. Satan believes that Jesus went to the cross. Satan believes that Jesus rose again. Would anybody say that Satan is a believer? You see, for you to understand and, and recognize the historical reality of Jesus Christ does not create a believer out of you. You have to re recognize that it's a present tense reality. God entered your world at the moment of need that you had to offer you a salvation that's complete and full and free and breaks everything that you're experiencing now to give you on a completely different life. He comes in, and He is something powerfully and wonderfully different. You are invested into His home. You are co-heirs with Christ. You will reign with Him. You see, God's love is to be admired, not because the world was so big, and includes so many people with the offer of the gospel. But because the world, including you, was so bad. Family, that's why when we see the present tense reality, that it's important for us to go through that reminder that we admit to ourselves that we couldn't have fixed ourselves, cleaned ourselves up, in any way presented ourselves in a better way so that we could cross that bridge from the reality of earth to the reality of heaven to be with the Father. None of us are sufficient to do that, and we admit that. Not only that all of us are, but that I am not specifically. I admit that. I cannot get to heaven by myself. I cannot avoid facing the wrath of God. And we recognize in the work of Jesus Christ something to believe in. I believe that, that in that knowledge, in that awareness of the work of Jesus Christ that happened in history, but I recognize is important and powerful and practical and necessary in my life now. And I don't believe in just the historical awareness, but I accept the gift of that. And I partner myself, and I become one with Jesus Christ, who paid my price, who accepted the wrath of God, allows me to be at peace with Him. And in doing so, 
I commit my life to Him. As a spouse in marriage would say, that we marry one another until death do us part. I create a commitment of love loyalty with my Savior Jesus Christ that my desires are His desires. And more importantly, His desires are my desires. And that when I take on that commitment, the love that Jesus Christ gave to me, that the Holy Spirit poured into me, is now mine to take to brothers and sisters in Christ, is now mine for the world to see in me, so that when my life is lived out, the agape love of Jesus Christ has a chance to be seen simply because of my love expressed out of who I am. The love of God which has no definition away from salvation has complete definition as it's lived out in your heart as one who's committed to knowing, loving, and following the Savior Jesus Christ. Now family, that should have monstrous impact on us. That should be life-changing. I want you to understand it was for Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley recognizes that he had a birthday of salvation on May 21st, 1738. See, he had already been a pastor slash missionary for 10 years. He had come to America. If I remember right, he had went to the, 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 the state of today, Georgia, to represent church and Jesus Christ. He came home to England and accepted Christ as his Savior. Within a few days, he writes one of the first hymns that he will become famous for in hymnology. The hymn is, And Can It Be? As he understands the reality of his salvation, it becomes a wonder of what God could do for him. And let me read, if you will, two of the stanzas. Stanza three says it this way. He, Jesus, left his Father's home above. So free, so infinite His grace. Emptied Himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free. For, oh my God, it found out me. The chorus that many of us who are a little older are quite familiar with. Amazing love, how can it be? For, oh my God, it found out me. God found us in His love. He says this in the fifth stanza. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in Him is mine. Alive in Him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Behold, I approach the eternal throne. I need to stop right there. Family, do you know how incredibly privileged you are? Though I approach the eternal throne, we have peace with God, Romans 5. We have peace with God. Only one man in the Bible Ask the question, God, let me see you. Moses was clearly told by God, you, you can't look on me. You, you can't be near me. I, I can't give you that view. The intensity of my radiance is too wonderful. You'll die. But I'll get you the twilight. I'll let you see what it looks like when the sun's gone down and it's just barely embers there in the skyline. You can see my afterglow. That's all I can see with you. John, in Revelation chapter 1, saw the living Lord Jesus Christ, and it says he shook like a dead man. But the response of Jesus was not the response of, the, of God in the Old Testament. Now Jesus says, no, John, it's me. It's me. Don't be afraid. 
and reflecting that. That wonderful privilege of no longer being under the wrath of God. Charles Wesley could say, Behold, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Family, what kind of gift do you think of when you think of the privilege of the incarnation of Jesus Christ? Do you think of something that altered your reality for eternity? Or do you think of a cute little baby in a manure-filled barn by which you can set presents around and make it just one more part of the Christmas story when there is no Christmas without a Savior who was willing to identify with each one of us. Father in heaven, I'd ask that you'd watch over. Dear God, allow, allow Christmas to be a reality because we understand the love of God to a greater degree, though we'll never fully grasp what allowed you to enter into our world, to tie yourself to our world. And dear God, be with us, recognizing that your success is tied forever with our success. That our Redeemer, dear God, in becoming incarnate, identified Himself with humanity so strongly that forever, in divinity, He will be humane. And dear God, as human, He is our mediator. Father in heaven, the Trinity's success and glory is tied forever to our happiness. And dear God in heaven, may we grasp that more fully and live it out that men and women may see the love of God when they see the people of God. In Jesus' name, amen.